My name is Charlie Bamforth. I am the uh, Professor of Malting and Brewing Science here at UC Davis. This is the mill room, so this is where malt will be crushed basically into a flour which will make it readily extractable. Malt quality is essential. We have all these different measures for malt to make sure we got the right malt for the right occasion. Well, what we're going to do is to mash now. So we've, we've milled the grain, the water's in there, and now he's going to make sure he adds it, and he adds it evenly, so you get a consistent porridge, if you like. You know, brewing is enzymes in action. In the early 19th century, they didn't know about that. I mean, if you go way back, there were no thermometers. So how do they work out the right temperature? It's, you know, whether they could see their face in the steam, uh, whether they could put their thumb in it, the rule of thumb, particularly in the last uh, 100, 120 years, people have worked out the science of brewing and, and now we say hey that's why well, this is the lauter tun this is where we separate the solid material it's a liquid we want we call it wort the solids are going to go off the cattle feed cows love them the brew kettle is where we boil the wort and traditionally that's where we boil it with hops this is how beer saved the world for the longest time people and they had no idea about bacteria and so they drank the water and got sick and they found when they drank the beer, they didn't get sick. And the reason is, when you make beer, you boil. And so this kills off all of those nasty, unwanted organisms. Well, after this, basically taking liquid from the kettle boil and spinning it around in that vessel, swirling it around, so that all the insoluble material collects in a pile in the center at the bottom. And you can separate the clear liquid away from all this junk that you don't want to go on into the rest of the process. All right. so. It's hot there, it's, it's sensibly boiling, and the yeast isn't gonna like that, so we've gotta cool it down. So what we do is we, we take the hot wort and pass it through this, a bit like a car radiator. Very rapidly, you cool the wort down. Back in the day, they put the wort into a tank, a big tank, right at the top of the brewery to allow the steam to come out. But you know, passing aerial traffic may make contributions to the wort. So not always the most hygienic thing, but uh, very interesting for providing a rich microflora, uh, which is much more complicated than yeast alone. They're still used actually for certain Belgian lambic beers. So these are, are really scaled down versions of the fermenters you'll get on a commercial scale. So we're putting the wort, the oxygen into the wort, and we've added the yeast. And now it's, it comes into here and it's fermented. The sugars are being converted into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Uh, you're producing more yeast, you're producing different flavor components as well. Every stage we regulate it and control it. We don't have vintages, you know, every year is a vintage. We look for consistency. And I always tease those blind guys and say, you know, get a bunch of grapes and tread on them and wait. What do you do while you're waiting? You drink beer. Uh, but there are various enemies of beer. One is light. If beer is exposed to light, the bitter substances from the hops break down to give a skunky aroma. But any brewer knows that most of the light is held back with a brown glass. Not totally, but pretty much. If you've got green glass or clear glass or even worst of all, blue glass, um, the light gets in. You know, people don't like to hear this, but beer in a can is usually more stable than beer in a bottle. No light can get into a can. And the second thing is, oxygen makes beer go stale, develops cardboard flavors. And in the bottle, in between the crown cork and the neck of the bottle, air can creep in with time. And it depends how tight that seal is. So if you have a twist off, then that will allow a lot more air in the beer than if it's a pry off crown cork. You know, if you go into a bar and there's 30, 40, 50 beers on tap, say five or 10 of those aren't terribly popular and they're sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. That ain't good. And although beer will not support the growth of pathogens, it will support the growth of other organisms, which will actually give you things like the, the butterscotch flavor. So whenever I go into a bar like that, which is not usual, but if I do, I always say, well, which of these do you sell the most of? And that's pretty much the one I'll choose. Now, we did some work. We found that one in every three people like skunky flavors. So, you know, it's horses for courses. It's, it's what you like. Like all good beer people, you've got to have your opener, nice clean glass, and then you pour with vigor. And so you're basically producing all this wonderful foam. You've got all the, the color, the yeast having converted those sugars into alcohol, produced all the carbon dioxide. Beautiful little bubbles. So you've got the proteins from the grain, the bitter acids from the hops sticking together. That's just nectar.
Very good.